Hey, everybody. This is Chris. This show is called The Weekly Spinner Rack, where we're going to talk about the latest in comic book news. We're going to uh, take a look at some of the new comics that came out this week. I'm pretty excited to talk about uh, that stuff with you later tonight. Moon Man, Duke, some really interesting stuff. But I'm really excited uh, to, to start this off with an interview. This is an incredible creator. You've seen his work on things like Moon Knight. You've read his creator-owned books, Time Before Time, Old Dog. Who, paying attention to comics, has not heard about Thundercats? Well, that's what he's writing next. Folks, I'm really excited to introduce our guest today, Mr. Declan Shalvey. How are you, sir? Hello. How's it going? What, Thundercats? I don't know what you're talking about. Never no? <laughs> it, no. It, I just... um. I mean, I think of Thundercats as something from my childhood. I'm Gen X. And I sincerely thought that we were at a point where Gen X interests were not going to be as big as whatever millennials grew up with. But, I mean, look at the the numbers on, on Thundercats and, and other books like Transformers, G.I. Joe, Ninja Turtles. These are the things I grew up with. I, I wasn't planning on starting with it, but but after you referenced that, like, is this something you grew up with as well? Well, yeah, it's hard not to notice all those zeros, isn't it? <laughs> there's, there's a lot of zeros after the, the copies yeah. being ordered for number one. <clears throat> Yeah, I wish I could take credit for it, like, but um, like clearly, uh, there's like I've been saying, there's two words which are delivering the sales on this, and it's the words thunder and cats. Um, but uh, no, yes, I was a, <clears throat> I was a big fan. I mean, I was uh, in Ireland. Things kind of took a while to get to us, so I can't remember exactly what age I was when I first saw Thundercats. But um, uh, I just remember the, the team that opening theme. Uh, oh, it's pretty fantastic. It just blew uh, my brain. Um, but I have, a ter- I have a terrible memory, so I actually don't remember a lot of the sh- love the specifics of the show. Okay. But I remember loving it. Like, you know, I remember, like, I specifically remember watching it. It's just um, a lot of the specifics kind of fell out of my head in the in the years since. So when I was offered the gig, I was just, I just thought, like, this would be really fun. It's ongoing. Um like from a writing point of view, that's great because you don't always get to do ongoings, like, you know, uh, in the same way as you could maybe a few years ago. Okay. So I was like, this would be cool. I loved, I love, you know, love Thunder Cats. Um, get a good, uh, get a good artist. Like this could be a really fun gig. Okay. Um, like, and then keep in mind, like, you know, the the issue was long written by the time the the sales numbers came out. So I was, you know, I was like, oh god. <laughs> In a way, I guess it's good that I didn't have that pressure over my shoulder for the first issue. But um, probably I'm feeling a little bit now. <laughs> well, I, I think that you should feel comfortable with it because it's not like this is your 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 first rodeo. This is not your first time sure. writing or anything. So mm-hmm. so I'll, I'll I'll loop back to to Thundercats because there's a bunch that we all want to know about it. But I, I, I've got an opportunity to talk to you about some of your other work, and I I, I was curious about one thing. You know, Moon Knight. I think that your designs for characters like Mr. Knight and Khonshu, um, I think a lot of people have called those very iconic, very memorable. And then they got translated very literally for that Disney Plus show. I was just kind of curious, for somebody like you, do you feel like all of a sudden you have a cultural touchstone you can point to there? Or is it something like totally divorced from what you work on? Like, what, what does that feel like when you see your work translated into a, another medium so literally. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. Um, I mean, I'm a little detached from it because what the version they did of, of Mr. Knight isn't really what we did in the comics. Not quite um, the character wise. Yeah. Well, I, I got to go see the premiere in LA and um, I saw my sister and like, she, she doesn't read comics. So she turned to me and she goes, she said like, is this much of a, uh, of, how did you put it? a clown or i can't remember she was very nice about it but she's like is he like this in your comic i was like no he's really cool um but like yeah. uh, so you know i was so i'm a little divorced because of that you know but um uh um oh she's i'm sorry i saw i saw the irish language pop up on my brain oh yeah yeah i was just like it. putting that somebody i i assumed that that was irish yeah, i kind of talk to you robbie um that's very nice but um 
Uh, but, but I mean, it is very interesting to see something that I made kind of, you know, affect the popular culture to some degree, you know, like it is handy now. Like, um, when I was a kid, if I said I, I liked Marvel, nobody from, you know, my hometown would know what that is. Mm. Now everyone knows what Marvel is. And now I can point to like an actual TV show that's on Disney. That's nice. Plus, you know, so it's, that's kind of handy for like when you meet normal people. Um, but like. You know, but before that, it was only like really cool people who knew what it was because, you know, Moon Knight was a, it was a big hit <clears throat> when it came out. But, we you know, it's kind of like a it's the closest thing to like a cult hit at Marvel. You know, it wasn't Spider-Man. It wasn't Avengers. It was Moon Knight, like who, you know, only hardcore Moon Knight fans really knew anything about Moon Knight. And we got to do this kind of cool book where we were left to do our own great. thing and do really cool stuff. So for me, I mean, it's more the experience of working on the book with Warren and how he like gave me the space to really push me as an artist. Um, you know, the way I got to own, I, I never really got to own the visuals of a book before mm. that. Um, I, I was very lucky to work on books like Venom and uh, Thunderbolts and um, uh, right. a Deadpool, but I was always coming on after somebody. So my work would be secondary or tertiary to, you know, the first guy. Moon Knight was different. I got to basically from the ground up, build the whole look of the book, the cover, you know, the cover designs, the logo, the, you know, a lot of the visual identity of it. Um, and that was hugely exciting and invigorating. And um, it, it, it changed everything, you know, um, and, 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 you know, I'm, I'm just, I just keep chasing that. I'm just chasing that dragon the whole time now. That makes sense. I mean, of course, yeah. You, you a Marvel book uh, gets eyes on, on, um, on your work and uh you've been able to leverage that i think in a, in a really organic and and impressive way uh i've been enjoying a lot of your creator own stuff at image uh Thanks, man. now you're you know you're writing at least as much as you're drawing probably even more I, it made me wonder these days would you say that you have a typical work day or is there anything you could share with us about what kind of a balance you have between time writing and time drawing these days well these days it's mostly video calls uh mm. <laughs> to promote thundercats there's <laughs> a lot of them um it, it changes day to day um because i basically have three different jobs i would say one is writing one is drawing one is covers oh sure um, you know i would do a good few covers a month um i remember in the old days of marvel it was just basically sequential pages and that's all i had to really worry about but now it's like um you know, there's things like solicits, you know, you're writing solicits and you're writing outlines and you're, um, you know, emailing everybody on the team. And like, there's just a hell of a lot more administra administrative stuff that comes with right, writing. Right, right. When, when I was an artist, I'm like, boo-hoo. But like <laughs> now that I'm writing, I'm like, I, I, I get it. You know, it's... Um, the the marketing it's more... falls to you at a certain point. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, especially when you're doing your own stuff, you know, um, it all, like, it's all on your own shoulders. And even with the creator and stuff, I mean, I'm probably doing more um, podcasts for Thundercats than I did for my last book, Old Dog, and that was all all me. Um, even with the work for hire stuff, you're still hustling. But um, no, it, it kind of changes. What I try to do is um, um, block out days to do one thing if I can, like maybe a day of writing and then four days of drawing because I find that I'm switching gears, uh, I lose momentum. Okay. Um, like if I'm if I'm drawing for three days straight, I can get a lot of drawing done. But if mm -hmm. I'm drawing for one day and then I have to go do something else, I feel like I'm not. By the time I kind of get going, it, it, I have to stop, and um, I, I need to build momentum from a drawing point of view. Um, and it's more physically demanding. Um, you sure. need to block out your day differently. But I mean, I just get up the same. I just hit it no matter what. But if I can, I will like try to. You know, if I have covers in a month, I'll try do my layouts within two days. I'll do like a Wolverine cover and a Time Before Time cover and a whatever else. Because I'm in that zone of like yeah. coming up with stuff. Um, I don't want to be in that zone and then go and have to like pencil a whole page. It's, it's different. It's different kind of. Um, oh, no question. I mean, even sequential story. storytelling versus capturing somebody's eye with you know a nice composition and an, an iconic image I, i've always been surprised you know it, it, it's two very different skills even though it's all it comics is. like it, it really is amazing um 
in a way, how little that gets. I mean, it's, 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 in a way, it's easier doing cover. I mean, the covers are, I mean, they're, they're, they're a lot of work and everything, and uh, a lot of illustrative elements into it. But like, just pages are just, they just take way more time, way more, I mean, way more hours on the board. Like, mm. it's, but like, that's, but that's the comics bit of it, you know, that's what, that's what I got into this for is to tell the stories. Uh, covers are great. I love doing them and I love writing too because we're telling stories. But uh, I mean, uh, the pure, like, Zen for me is, like drawing the actual pages and it takes more it takes more planning and efforts to like silo off time to work on those because like i said being mm -hmm. pulled away is it's is pretty hard um right. uh, so now I've, that's what the, that's my the hardest part now is finding the time to actually draw pages um where i'm not going to be pulled away um you know it's a tough life but i guess someone's got to do it I mean, hopefully the, the, it, it, it's what you love doing because I agree, like, I, you know, it's a lot of hours. It's a lot of like, you know, quiet time by yourself until you can hear the response uh, from people. Uh, it, I, 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 I did, some, did some things recently where I was talking to people about, about comics and there was two points I made was that, um, you know, you need to be able to be on your own uh, for mm -hmm. long periods of time. And maybe even do some friendships because people would be like, what, why aren't you hanging out? Yeah. And it's because like, I'm trying to, you know, get paid takes, take, take, <laughs> takes, yeah well it takes a long time to do this stuff you know and also just like dedication if you're not if you're not all in on it like i'm not saying you can't do it but you won't last just because it mm -hmm. just takes so much time and energy and you know anyone can draw a comic book page but can you draw you know another one the next day and 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 you know that kind of um uh marathon run is not something right you, i hear you know, that from a do. lot of artists to be honest mm -hmm. like that that marathon um in, in, analogy um we've touched uh, on several pieces of things you did but i'm curious when we sort of line up your career on a timeline you know we've got you um getting to marvel um which awesome like really fun characters and then <sighs> you went and then you got to <laughs> do a lot of creator own stuff i mean three years basically on time before time old dog i mean that th those are some long stints doing your own ideas and now of course thundercats though is licensed so i i i'm curious you know what was the appeal there like what what what's what's the fun or the challenge what what draws you to t to sort of um uh, make another shift well um for being on i mean being honest a large part of it was knowing I could write a long story. Um, mm. It's one of the reasons I did Alien for last year at Marvel as well, was like I knew I had 10 issues to tell a story. Um, like time before time, we wrapped it up at 29 issues. But like when we started the book, we didn't know if we'd last past five. And then we realized okay. we could probably keep going after five. And we're like, can we go as far as 10? And it's like, okay, and okay, we're going as far as 10. I think we can probably get to 15. And then at 15, we're like, okay, well, probably going to need to wrap it up in one arc but we could probably keep it going for one more we we knew we wanted to do longer story but the logistics of doing a creator own story long term is i mean the first thing happens in every any interview it's like is this is this ongoing or a mini series and like my answer's like that's down to you <laughs> you because know, yeah it, i'd like I, if it doesn't sell then you just can't keep doing it and um you know yeah. it's economics it's always at that difficult. point Sorry, pardon? Oh, I just said it's economics at that point. That's it, you know. Yeah. Whereas the nice thing about uh, work for hire is there, you've just there's more. I mean, there's still you know uh, economics to it as well, but you know you have a little bit more room to like tell a story that you can seed things. And I mean, some stories should be short. You know, that's of not course. like say I did a I've done a couple of graphic novels, and they're that's all they are. That's great. But from a creative creative point of view, having something where you can really kind of sit in the world and try build something i like making things and I like building things and um it was a great opportunity having with alien wrapping up so i got to do it with alien and i really liked it to be the kind of um even though i wasn't drawing it be yeah like the creative tip of the spear of course um, it's great because you can have all the ideas and you can suggest them and you don't actually have to implement them because the artist does that it's great <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, but no, but it is, and it's also really like satisfying to work with somebody else and see what they've they're bringing to the table. You know, um, I I'm a fan of art. That's why I like writing. I think is because I'm a fan of artists and I like trying to come up with stuff that uh, works for them. But sorry, but to answer your question, it was it was it was partly that the okay. opportunity to kind of do something creatively um, 
play with a different skill set. Mm. But also, I mean, I like I have great huge affection for the original cartoon and and like the brief was, you know, do your own thing. It's not like adapt the cartoon, please. It was like, do you want to take a concept and run with it? And I did, and it's been really, really fun. Uh, I have to imagine that being an artist yourself, your artists must appreciate the the, the freedom you give them or the the, the direction. I mean, because every artist is going to be different, but at least you can come from it from a very uh, visual perspective. I, I have to imagine that's an advantage. It, it depends. I was talking to him. Um, I mean, Drew Moss loves me. That guy is sending me love letters. Good. He likes me so much, uh, which is great. Um, Hi, Drew, if you're, uh, if you're watching. Um, <laughs> but uh, I was talking to Andrea Bricardo, who was drawing Alien, and um, he told me he was very nervous about working with a writer-artist because I think I think he thought I would be very demanding or mm. it needs to look like this or, and um, you know, uh, maybe looking over his shoulder. And, I mean, I think the benefit of having been an artist working with writers is, and I've been very lucky, don't get me wrong, I, I, I have no complaints, but um, I would hate for somebody to, to like, treat me like a pencil. You know, I would sure. never want that. So I never want to do that for anybody else. But what's what I find is most artists who work with me actually want me to kind of, you know, um, be more involved. So I try and um, I try and lead from the start, as in with suggestions, and then kind of, you know, hands off and let them do their thing. Because I also think if an art if an artist is excited about what they're working on, I, I really I really do feel like that um, energy flows into the work this sounds very pretentious but um yeah you know, the shoe fits um that uh you, you know like you remember the excitement of like jim lee x-men and oh of course you know all those books like the, the, you know you can feel the energy in those and sure. i have to believe it's because he was so excited about what he's working on um and yeah if, if i think if an artist feels that they're engaged in the work and they're not just a hired hand um you know even though i mean we all are <laughs> um but uh I think it does inject something into, into their work and that injects into the page and that injects it into the reading experience. Um, that's just my crazy theory. Well, I, I have to imagine you're right, but I also have to imagine that you know how much action is reasonable to put on a page, how much, you know, uh, it's it would be asking to design, you know, a spaceship, how much it would be asking to say an army comes over a hill. Like you're, you, you understand what you're asking uh, of your collaborator in a situation. Like yeah, that. that's true. I, I would say from drawing a lot of comics, you do, or at least I have um, gathered a kind of a, a shorthand for okay. knowing what's going to fit or, you know, people have been talking for a couple of pages. We need something to blow up, you know, that kind of thing. Like, or, and also, you know, when you're, you know, sometimes when I'm writing, I'm like, I, I, if, if I was drawing this, I'd want to, I want something. I need something in here to keep me engaged. You know, 20 pages of people talking is not going to deliver exciting comics. So I think um, that might be an advantage is that I have that really instilled in me in that, like, you know, you can't, it can't just be, you know, dessert all the time. Sometimes you need to, like, you know, give the story what it needs. But, I, you know, I, I feel like I have a fairly good instinct for when, you know, I just need to, like, Somebody needs to punch somebody, you know. <laughs> Hopefully, we see a lot of that in Thundercats. But but let's talk about genres because um, you've obviously tackled a bunch of superhero stuff. I would say Time Before Time is closer to harder science fiction. Old Dog was uh, sci-fi, but also spy, you know, espionage stuff, a, a little lighter. With Thundercats, you know, do you approach that? closer to superheroes is it sci-fi is it fantasy like you know i'm just curious like to get in your mindset when you approach thundercats do you have any genres that you're keeping in mind when you're crafting a story for them um sure yeah, that's a good, good question like i mean when i was doing alien it's very clear what genre that is <laughs> you know it's it's a uh, alien genre um, absolutely no you're right like i i i mean i my sensibilities lean a little dark you know so it, i love superheroes but like you know my my ultimate is like frank miller batman daredevil that type of stuff um but i love fun stuff as well like i worked on you know books like uh, thunderbolts were was great fun you know very emotional yeah. very you know moving in places but like you know a lot of fun um uh, but i think like say that's i think old dog probably taps into who like the, my core storyteller you know yeah that had adventure if folks haven't read it but it also does have some 
serious drama behind it, family relationships, some themes about, you know, getting older and it, 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 it's got some serious stuff behind it. I totally know what you mean there. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, then sometimes, you know, the Clint Eastwood looking guy punches somebody through a wall. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, there's um, like I like I'm a big crime comics fan, you know, but I, like so I, I did I've done a couple of Irish based um, crime graphic novels, which I I'd love. I love to do more of that stuff. It just it doesn't really sell as much. Um, so it's a it's a harder thing to kind of get off the ground. But I still but but I, I still grew up reading Spider-Man, X-Men, you know, okay. so I, I definitely have um, like old school, you know, gr- classic superhero stuff in my DNA. Um so even so, no matter how I do my grim and gritty old dog book, it's still kind of a superhero book. Oh yeah, you know. You know so um, uh, but you know, so my my tastes, you know, can spread out. So when so I think Thundercats is probably the most after doing a year of Alien, which was very dark, and I wasn't expecting that gig, but when I got it, it, it I felt it really suited me. I really liked writing that world, and that wrapped up. So then when Thundercats came along, I was like, okay, this is very different, but you know. I'm going to approach this as a sci-fi concept, which okay. I think it is. But I also think superheroes are a sci-fi concept. Um, my take uh, on yeah, on I it's, think that, I think that when you go back to the earliest superheroes, they all sort of had hmm. sci-fi origins. That, that there's no question there. So, um, so I, I don't necessarily think of the super genre too much as much as I kind of just see it as an ex- expansion of sci-fi. So okay. I went into Thundercats. Kind of my approach was like it's Thundercats, but like with Lost in Space. Mm. Yeah, you know. Um, oh wow like, you know the sci-fi elements this kind of family element um and like having to navigate because those that I, I re-watched the character the, the cartoon and i felt like it just jumped a huge step you know, where it was they land it was and then pretty all of a sudden, unique for what it was wasn't it like it was oh, no no it was no i mean yes yeah. which, which actually watching it it was way more sci-fi than i remembered it being uh, to be honest all of a sudden and there's so like, like oh, actually, and stuff and and robear yeah, burbles and <laughs> yeah, I watch it kind of going like, oh, I'm going to have this unique sci-fi um, as- aspect, and then I'm watching, I'm like, no, this is actually very, <laughs> this is actually very sci-fi, um, probably more. Of, um, I probably leaning away from the fantasy-ish bit of it. I'm just not really a fantasy guy, um, but um, I, but as I was writing it, I was like, this is '90s X-Men, you know. Mm. I just felt like, okay, you know, um, well, it's also hard not to hear that theme music <laughs> when you're working on it, but I felt like. You know, it's got a little bit of soap, you know, soap opera elements, you know, with character dynamics, you know, you're going to have to fight somebody here and there. So I felt like it, it, as I was working on it, it actually felt like more like I was I was writing more of a superhero book than I intended on writing. Um, so, yeah, it just kind of feels like I'm writing like X-Men or something, you know, um, as regards comics. Cool. Um, so, yeah, it's actually been um, I, I wanted a more serious sci fi take on the concept. OK. Um but it's, it's, I think it's probably lightened a little bit as, as as I was working on it, you know. That's that that I'm excited to check it out. I I am, and mm-hmm. I would also, say when that... you see Drew's work, like Drew Drew, you see what Drew's drawing. It's kind of hard not to lean into. He can do anything. He can do great That's character acting. He can do superhero action. He can do mood, you know, and uh, atmosphere. So I just find like, okay, I can lean into this, and I can lean into that, and I can lean like. So he's giving me everything. Do you feel an obligation to um, pull from, you know, the lore of, 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 you know, later episodes and seasons of the show? Or do you feel that, like, you know, you can introduce a, a good amount of new ideas to, to, to all of this? Well, I mean, I think it's already out there that there's a new character in issue two. It's mm-hmm. like, I think it's in the solicits and stuff. Um, so, yes, I can good. add, <laughs> I can add new things. That's exciting. But, um, yeah, no, no, it is. Like, I, I just wanted to start with the core and build it out. Um, like a lot of the questions I'm getting are very specific about like is this in it and is that in it and I'm trying to um, uh, oh uh, thanks uh, Mike and then, I haven't um, highlighted everything by the way Declan there's a lot of very kind comments oh, really? in, in, oh, oh yeah cool. yeah I'm just every once in a while popping one just up just to, to you let you guys here. know I, I, I'm reading it all while I'm talking to Declan but there's a lot of really kind supportive comment, comments for your work oh, which is nice oh, to hear oh. Oh, thanks for um, uh, you guys uh, but uh, sorry, I can't remember what I was saying. Um, I, with, I interrupted. Uh, oh, you, sorry. So. Yeah, no, uh, no, 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 you're fine. Uh, it was with the compliments, so uh, <laughs> interrupt away. <laughs> That's um, uh, no, it was, yeah, I think that there's a lot of hardcore fans are, are kind of looking for specific things, and I'm trying to like go, don't, don't, don't look for things because I definitely will pull from lore 
you know, established lore, but but okay. not in the established way, if that makes sense. Great. Like if you're an old school Can we get fan, something a little new? Yeah, you yeah, it's I'm it's a new story um following the core concept, but it's not it's got its own journey, you know. And if you're an old if you're an old school fan, you're gonna see things that like you'll recognize, but you know, I'm not I wanna be clear, I'm not doing the comic adaptation of the cartoon. You know, it's got it's it I think Drew's designs are a good kind of indication of, you know, the the, the core design, but yeah, there are some yeah. alterations, and that's kind of the same story wise. It's the core story, but uh, doing our own thing. Now you mentioned that you know there, there's there's something um, satisfying with going into an existing property because you you'll have a chance to tell a longer story. That makes a lot of sense. At the same time, did you have any? expectations that you know 175,000 copies for issue one did you have any expectations for something close to that or is that definitely a surprise because I, I was a little surprised they've tried that was, uh, a couple times before I think I think when I was told my response was fuck off <laughs> and I <laughs> no I don't even know what comics do those numbers anymore um I, I know that it's it's less transparent now, so you, you know you never know if a book's doing well or not. Um, that that's was, true. That's something I've been complaining about. Is I'd love a little more transparency on sales for everybody's sake. But yeah, like, so so would I. As somebody who makes the books, I would also like that. I only know my own books. You know, how do you measure your spend, anything? Stuff. Yeah, but but um, still, this I, one um, obviously, of course, Dynamite's going to be putting that out there I, in a press release. Like this is this I is thought, huge. I thought that it would. I thought it would do well. Um, that's another reason I took it. I was like, oh, this will do. Well, that makes sense. The fact that they that were they were proud, like I have basically I was I have a year uh, personally. Like the book is ongoing. I have a year's worth of stories planned. Wow. Which is again creatively great. Um, uh, one, one reason I wanted to do it, but also um, uh, I, I clearly they thought it would do well enough that it would go that long. You know, it wasn't just going to be a five issue miniseries. Good point. Um, and there's there's reason to think it. You know, sure, it's an old property, and there hasn't really been, you know, a Thundercats take in a long time. You know, no, it's been it a while. Been... Yeah, so um, I figured, no, this will probably do well. And I thought maybe like, you know, what does a licensed book do? Like forty thousand, like fifty maybe, ish, yeah. at best. You know, um, so I thought like this could do quite well, but I was expecting a moderate success. Um, not what not what's coming in now it's insane it's it's crazy i can't i can't believe it you know i hope you give yourself a piece of that success it's... declan i i know it's uh it, you're not gonna just <laughs> brag about it but i i do think that you should um absolutely claim a piece of that success you've been um you know working in the industry for quite a while and building up i think a a, a pretty loyal contingent that's going to be a component yeah, but, of that thundercats yeah, but I, can, I can tell i can tell you Chris, like the whole dog didn't sell <laughs> it didn't sell 170,000 copies like, you know maybe not but the, it's going to be a, a a chunk within that is all i'm saying so i think you know, sure no 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 sure no i am not I, i'm I, i'm I, paying you a compliment on that i appreciate no i, I appreciate that i um, i would like to think that um there's people I, I was, it was it was actually said to me by somebody they said oh i actually i know i've heard of thundercats but i don't know i've never seen it and i've never read it but i know your work right. so i'll check it out that's nice to hear you know i i'm uh, sure it's the minority but it's nice to hear you know i have to imagine that there are going to be a, a good number of readers that are younger than like myself anyway because i really feel like i was just you know i was a kid when thundercats was out there's going to be some younger people that aren't as familiar with thundercats like you say, it hasn't really been out in a while. The, it's going to be new to them. And, and I think that there are people that will be checking out. out. We're, we're going to see. You know, is it too mm. soon at this point to notice whether you're getting any um, extra attention on your existing books? Or is that something that you, you'll probably, or, or have you seen anything like that? I, it's, it's, it's probably too soon because um, Just Time Before Time is already wrapped up. Um, I'll, be bring, I'll be bringing out a new, um, I'll be bringing out an old dog uh, how do I describe it? Feature, for lack of a better term, okay. uh, during the year. I wonder if that'll be, actually that'll be interesting to see if that that does. It will be. I, I I'm hopeful. I enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, yeah, I thought that old dog. Uh, oh, good. Thanks. <laughs> good. <laughs> Rot <That's a> relief. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No no no. I uh, and and um, I've bought time before time, and I have to admit that I haven't read it yet, but I plan to. I plan to. I really. Actually, well, um, there's five. There's five volumes of it, so there's there's loads of it to read. I know that's a long run. I'm. I'd like to just shift real quick 
I don't know if there's anything you can say to this or not. This week in news, I noticed that you and a ton of other people left from Cadence uh, Comic Art. Is there anything you're able to say? I'm not trying to push. I was just curious if there's anything, because none of us quite understand what's going on is all. So I just thought yeah. I'd ask, but, but um, I'm, I'm not trying I'm a, to push I'm a Yeah, I'm a pretty open book, but I prefer not to say anything on that because there's a lot of other okay. people in, involved. We can move um, past it then, because the, yeah, I'm not the, trying yeah, so to do I, a gotcha I'm, here. I'm not, I'm, um, I'm not the type to like gloss over something, but yeah, if it was if it was me, it would be, it would be one thing, but there's a lot of people involved, so I prefer not saying anything. That's fair. That's fair. Um, that's not quite the kind of show that I, I'm doing here. But um, I'm trying to think. The So we've got Thundercats coming out uh, this this Wednesday, folks, if, if you're not aware. Like, if you haven't like uh, already ordered issue one, you know, go to your comic shop. Lots of variant covers, including one by you. Um, or uh, something Dynamite does a lot of. What else can um, my audience uh, take a look for, though? If they, if they're if maybe they check this out and it's the first thing they've read, like what else can they look for from you, Declan? Like this is your opportunity uh, to plug. Oh, plug, 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 shall we? Come on. Um, well, I'd say I'd say predominantly Old Dog, which is, it came out last year. The trade came out last year. It's only $10 for like 130 pages. Pretty um, good You value. can't really go wrong. Um, which is it's kind of like a, a, yeah, it's like a spy fi is how I describe it. Um, you know, super espionage type book, uh, which I drew and I wrote and drew and colored and designed and uh, it nearly killed me. But, yeah, um, colored. By uh, the way, I, I I I hate to interrupt after I just asked the question, but I but I I I noticed um, that you were the colorist on it, and I and I even felt like I was picking up on that when it was like I was uh, there. There were uh, whole swaths of of a color tone for for ver for for different scenes. So you was this the first time you've colored a project? Uh, no, I colored. Um, I did a one shot for Marvel, a Hulk, um, 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 Immortal Hulk one shot for Marvel, a year previous. Okay. Um, before before that's that that series wrapped up. Okay. And um, I, I wrote it and drew it, and I, I was coloring my own covers for a good for a few years, and I thought, mm -hmm. you know what, it would be cool to just try it out, see if I could color like a narrative and um, actually use color more for storytelling and marvel were cool about it and they let me do that um and That's then i cool. did when i did the um the um the vertical x-men unlimited with jonathan hickman and mm. um, I, I i colored that as well okay um, so yeah i've basically been like at it for a while but i was doing my when i was going to do old dog and i i was going to work with the colorist who i'm a huge fan of but i remember thinking if i'm going to do an image book it's kind of got to, I feel like I got to really step up and it wouldn't make sense for me to do everything on a Marvel project and not do it on an image project, which okay. is more, you know, mine. So I felt like I would have been shortchanging myself. Um, but no, I actually really, really, I like, I like, I like storytelling. Writing is a way of telling stories in a different way. And so is draw, like I was used to drawing mm -hmm. color is another way. So it's, I just feel like my, um, my, my, cool. my tool belt has, has has grown. I've got more ways to own and tell a story, and um, it's it's Are, it's more it's made it a more satisfying experience overall. Would you be interested in getting to a point where you even went ahead and lettered it as well, just to sort of say I I sort of did the whole thing? I hate I hate lettering. I I lettered Did indie you? comics when I was starting out, but I bought oh, um, where was it? Um, I bought that um Nate Picos lettering book. Um, uh, okay. recently, I'm like, why? I, I don't want to do this. I don't want a letter, <laughs> but I bought it, so I'm probably going to at some stage. But I can say, with the design, like, I just like, like, like uh, designing, it was just, I get, I think, um, I didn't like not knowing how to do something, and I do think it's quite important if you're doing comics, you at least understand the process. Like, if you can't write, that's fine, but I'll give it a try and see what the experience is like. And I think from doing lettering in my indie days. It was very good training for me to like always make sure I leave room for where the balloons are going, where you know placement, things like that. So the more you understand the other disciplines, I think it makes you better at the one you specialize in. I'm glad that you learned it, but if it doesn't appeal to you, like you know, no reason to burn yourself out creatively. But, yeah, so what it is is, is uh, do I want to spend more time on the computer, or do I want to, you know, do I want to spend more time drawing, designing, writing, or learning lettering? And I probably will at some stage, but I just feel um. Um, like I'm going to do a new project now and I've decided not to color it um, okay. because um, 
I want to, I want to, it's a work for hire thing. So I want to get back to old dog as soon as I can. And I realize, do I want to color these pages or do I want to get back to writing and drawing old dog, you know, things like that. But sorry, I, I wasn't done plugging. Um, no, I, uh, I had interrupted, please. What else? Uh, we've got okay. old dog is out in trade paperback now. <laughs> yes. Um, time before time volume five is out at the end of this month. Yep. Um, and uh, that's that wraps up the main storyline. But we're actually going to do one more trade afterwards that collects. Um, we did one shots that take place through oh, the series, and okay. okay. uh, that take place outside the main narrative. So we're actually going to collect those as well. So that'll be that'll be out later this year. Um, Alien, the last my last issue of Alien is out the same day as Thundercats issue one, which is a little weird. Competing um, with yourself, but you can. Yeah, <laughs> you can get um uh the first the first. Arc is called Taw, and that's out. Um, that's out now. You can pick that up. Um, and I've got to stop working on books to start with TH because I can't pronounce them. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think it's a different thing. And also, like a rake of covers, I forgot. I think the new Duke. I've got a. Like, I can't keep track of covers. That's Do the you? one thing I know. I never know they're coming out. I, I I look forward to that. I'm a. I just grew up a big GI Joe fan, so I, I'm looking. For that, that that's exciting to hear. Declan, this has been a, a, a huge pleasure. I I, um, I really admire your work. And just so that folks know, De Declan stayed up. Well, it, it's just, it's pretty darn late his time. So um, very, very kind of you to stay up and uh, and, and meet us. Um, best of luck with Thundercats uh, as it continues. And I'm definitely excited to see more Old Dog. Uh, thanks a million, man. Cheers. And thanks for the, thanks for, let me um, hawk my wares. <laughs> Absolutely. No, anytime. Very, very, uh, very much appreciate it. Declan, have a uh, pleasant evening. Thank you so much, sir. Cheers. Take care. Right. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Folks, uh, hopefully you got as much pleasure out of that as I did. Um, big fan of Declan's work. So that was that was just really exciting to get to, to talk to him. And, um, you know, seeing these numbers on Thundercats uh very very interesting gives me definitely a lot of hope for comics when i see not just thundercats but you know ninja turtles and duke and transformers i'm just like sort of looking at some of the comics that i have here doing very very well so um yes i agree folks um oh that's kind of you daniel thank you and it's nice to see you um the interviews are fun i have fun doing them i have fun uh, the Thundercats f for issue one, 175,000 copies, folks. I, I thought I may have mentioned it in the interview, but but it might have been in passing. 175,000 copies. Yes, it was 130 over uh, in Ireland, uh, and that's where Declan was calling from. So pretty amazing, pretty amazing. Um, the, the the those are those are huge numbers. Uh, any any in any era, just to be clear. Um, yes, there was a brief period where things like Superman were was selling like you know a million, but um, those days are pretty pretty far in the past. Um, tell you what, let's get into the news of the week. Does that sound like fun? Yes, Chris, it does. That's so kind of you to say. Wow, you guys you're gonna make me feel good. Nailed it with the uh, thumbnail, no question. All right, so first piece of news here is uh batman comics have a new group editor and you guys if you've been to a comic store you've probably seen just how many batman and batman related titles are out there right now because you know it's not just batman and detective we've got batman and robin and uh brave and the bold and uh you know i don't know probably harley and joker and riddler all have their own uh series so Yes, uh, a Qbert. Uh, God loves uh, comics. So, Katie Qbert. Uh, we knew, if you've been watching the news, uh, Ben Abernathy stepped down as DC Comics Batman Group Executive Editor in January. Probably taking another position somewhere else. I'm not sure where yet. That hasn't been confirmed. But that's a big deal. Like, that's a big editor editorial position to direct all that stuff. Um, Chip Zdarsky actually uh, revealed this. He In his Substack newsletter, he was talking about submitting his latest Batman script to new editor Katie Kubert. So now we know what she is doing and, and, and who is running the Batman stuff. Um, if you're not familiar with her history, uh, 
Katie has been in comics for quite a while at this point. She joined DC specifically back in 2011. Um, she did move to Marvel for a few years, uh, briefly at Insight. Uh, they do some comics and then like, but that was in 2017 and also uh, then back to DC. So she's been at DC again for, for a long stretch at this point, um, really worked her way up, you know, started as, uh, you know, a gopher essentially. I forget the exact uh, title, but um, yeah, that's a, it's a big deal. And if you're curious, yes, this is the granddaughter of Joe Kubert. She is the niece of Andy and Adam Kubert cousin to emma kubert so yes uh she is from that legacy uh that that is just to be clear five professionals uh four of them still alive and working uh in the kubert uh, dynasty the kubert uh, dynasty um for what it's worth it looks like this is technically temporary uh it, but but she is she is for now uh in in uh, in charge of Batman, at least for a few months until they install somebody else, but good for her. Yes, yes, exactly. She does have other existing responsibilities, but she is, um, stepping in for now. So that's pretty cool. Let's see. One of the Cuberts did the snake eyes reveal cover in GI Joe comics in the eighties. Um, Probably it was Adam, but I guess I'd have to look that up. Yeah, I don't. Anyway, the Cuberts are amazing. Uh, someday I will do an episode on comic tropes about Joe Kubert. Pretty influential and popular artist for a long time. Really, really amazing. DC uh, has announced who they've hired to play Supergirl in the movies. So I thought I'd just mention that. Uh, this actress here, who you may have seen, uh, that is an Australian actress. Oops, I only used her last name. Her name is Millie Alcock. I, I forgot to put in her first name somehow. <sighs> My first mistake ever on the show. Wow. I knew I'd make one someday, but I didn't think it would be tonight. What am I thinking? Uh, anyway, yeah, Millie Alcock, uh, she played the young version of Princess Reina Targaryen on House of the Dragon last season. Um, I, I like her. She, she, she was good. I did not love House of the Dragon. I did not dislike it per se. Um, I didn't like it anywhere close to what Game of Thrones is. I just didn't feel it had the same level of stakes behind it. Um, but the there, there is a great cast. I'm not going to knock any of the cast, to be honest. Um, and she was interesting. She, she, You know what? I was going to say what she has, but James Gunn said it best. Uh, James Gunn, you guys know he's the head of DCU. He posted on threads about uh, Millie's getting hired. He goes, said, I was watching House of the Dragon and thought she might have the edge, grace, and authenticity we needed for the DCU's Supergirl. Um, the, th that edge, I sort of get. She, she's, she's got something there and I don't know how else to describe it, but you know, like just, it's not like a feistiness or a meanness. It, it It's like an edge, like just a little bit of danger somehow to, to this character. You just feel like you, you can't, quite trust everything uh, uh, uh about this about reina and i thought that millie alcock did get that so i totally understand what james means with that uh by the way the trade publications have said that she's actually going to show up in a dcu movie before the supergirl movie not confirmed which movie she will be in supergirl based on the tom king bilquis evely miniseries fantastic miniseries uh but apparently she's going to show up in one DCU movie before. Seems likely that it could be Superman since Superman's going to go, you know, get filming soon. But that's not confirmed. That's not confirmed. Yeah, exactly. The Superman movie makes the most sense, but it's not confirmed. But we'll see. Uh, I have a follow up on a news story from last week. Last week, I talked about how a Memphis comic shop got broken into and the store owner had a sense of humor. He put up a temporary um, uh, piece of plywood and, and uh, spray painted. I assure you we're open. Uh, a clerk's reference. Uh, but there's there's a little bit more to this wild story that I came across. So first of all, uh, these thieves broke into 901 Comics as well as 901 Toys down in Memphis. 
uh, owned by the same people, but yeah, uh, separate. Yeah, Rhaenyra. What did I say? I don't know what I said. Um, I, I always mispronounce the names in Game of Thrones. Anyway, so the thieves broke into like one of the comic shops. There's some security video you can watch on like the local Fox affiliate. They go behind the counter. They look around. They're, they're, they're gone within a few minutes. They didn't take anything. But then they went down the street, apparently, and stole some comics from 901 Comics. I guess they, they might have more than one store. The, the, the news story was a little confusing there. But the owner, a uh, guy by the name of Shannon Merritt, he also found out that about $3,000 worth of merchandise was stolen from the shipping warehouse that he uses. Now, if somebody's breaking into both the store and the shipping warehouse, that sounds like an inside job. Like this, th I don't know for a fact, but that seems like a humongous coincidence. Here's what's funny though. Okay, so a local comic shop showed Merritt a photo of some men that were trying to sell some comics. They thought it was suspicious. They thought it was probably the comics that were stolen from 901 Comics. So he knew what they looked like. And then he saw them on the street later that day. So he was able to call the police. He's like, yeah, I think I see the guys that robbed my store. And uh, the police have arrested a man named Kevin Davis in connection to the thefts. <laughs> I just got a kick that this guy's like solving his own crime. These, <laughs> my store was robbed. I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. That's so kind of you to give the the channel some support. Yeah, if you guys can hit like, uh, that's that's always appreciated. Hit subscribe. Maybe even consider uh, visiting the Patreon. Uh, that would be lovely. I am definitely in a lot of debt these days, but that's not your problem. That's mine. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's see. Moving on. Uh, this was interesting, but not unexpected. I think a lot of us know that South Korea has their digital comics, frequently called webtoons, huge, huge business, right? Huge business. Um, well, the government is talking about how much they plan to continue to invest in that. They see this as an industry with a lot of potential. This gentleman is South Korea's Minister for Culture, Sports, and Tourism. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce Korean names very well, so I'm just guessing Yu Inchon. Uh, and he announced at a press conference that the, the government plans to open a school dedicated to teaching how to make webtoons by the year 2027. Good for them. Let's see what happens. Uh, the government also announced that they plan to have a festival. That's probably going to be something like, you know, a Comic-Con, but more focused on Webtoons specifically. He also said the, the goal of the government is to grow the Webtoons industry to $2.9 billion. We're talking in U.S. dollars. Uh, and then exports, you know, like things that they're selling uh, to other countries, to $250 million by 2027. So that's their, that's their goal. Um, I really don't know who the character is behind. Sorry. So, okay, $2.9 billion uh, revenue for the industry, $250 million of that with exports. What? That's in 2027, three years from now. What is it today? So all I've got really is from like two years ago. But that at that point, the industry was estimated to be worth $1.89 billion with exports at $107 million. So uh, you know, five years from this figure, three years from now, plans to get it up to two, like, uh, basically another billion dollars, another billion dollars. Um, think of how much money that is in webtoons, folks. Like this is, it's, it's just wild. Yeah, exactly. That is a lot of webtoons. That's a really smart move for South Korea. It's the BTS effect. Hey, sure. I, I'm never going to go against the uh, BTS army. So sure. Let's give them uh, some of the credit here for Webtoons too. <laughs> uh, just, just amazing. Uh, Japan could never. Well, Japan has started investing. A lot of their publishers we've had in the news lately are, are heavily investing in creating um, online platforms and, and are looking to start formatting their, th their stuff like webtoons. Webtoons has a lot of appeal beyond South Korea. Like obviously like places like webtoons and tapas, 
uh, here in America are doing very, very well. Uh, it's also a very easy platform to utilize if you're breaking into comics. There's, there's very little in terms of barriers. Not to say that you'll instantly be making money, but you could put it on a platform that has a lot of eyeballs and that might get you an audience. If you're talented, it may be an, a new, easy, easier path to getting noticed. So, yeah. Uh, typically, they're, they're, they are all uh, done vertically. Uh, earlier in the interview, Declan was speaking about doing um, uh, an X-Men comic vertically for Marvel. Marvel has also been exploring this that he did with um, Jonathan Hickman, vertical scrolling. Yeah. Anyway, uh, you know, I got to mention this stuff because trust me, like, you know, uh, if I didn't, all of a sudden a year from now, I, I feel like I'm going to be behind because I think that this stuff is just growing. I think it's going to be a big part of comics. I really do. I was an American resident of Korea for 15 years, and they have literally put billions into the Korean wave promoting all types of Korean pop culture. So this tracks well. Hey, um, certainly their boy bands and a lot of their recent movies have been darn good. I, I think during the pandemic, the movie thing slowed down. But for a while, I felt like South Korea was all of a sudden making a bunch of really good horror and um, sort of dark drama movies. I was really enjoying a lot of the movies that were coming out of South Korea. Well, oh, we still got... um. What am I thinking? Um, Parasite was still a pretty huge movie, but that was a little while. Um, yeah. So we'll see what happens there. But uh, if you go on to Netflix these days, they've got like maybe 10 shows that are based on Korean webtoons. They've got a lot. They've got a lot. Hmm. Hold on. Um, something happened weird here with the formatting of the text. Let me get it all up. Okay. Anyway, Rogue Trooper is getting a movie. I like the character of Rogue Trooper, but Rogue Trooper is definitely uh, lesser known than, say, Judge Dredd or other books that come out in 2000 AD. Uh, but he's still been around for a long time. Let's talk about Judge Dredd a little bit. Um, yeah, I've seen The House, The Host, The Wailing was a really good Korean movie. Anyway, let me talk about um, Rogue Trooper. It, wasn't there a Rogue Trooper video game? I feel like I pr played a Rogue Trooper video game at one point. So uh, this week, actors, and I'm going to bu butcher this name, but Inurin Barnard, Haley Atwell, and Jack Loden have all been cast in the Rogue Trooper animated movie. Um, previously, we've heard that cast members would include Jermaine Clement, Matt Berry. Love his voice. Oh my God, Matt Berry is the best. Uh, Sean Bean, I think uh, Asa Butterfield was one of them. Uh, there's a bunch of good names. Uh, Jermaine also has an awesome voice. So it's based on, like I say, the 2000 AD character. This is going to be written and directed by Duncan Jones, who does have a somewhat mixed track record, but let's talk about Duncan Jones briefly. I really liked his first big movie, Moon, with Sam Rockwell. That was a good sci-fi movie. Then he did Source Code with Jake Gyllenhaal. It was an okay sort of sci-fi adventure movie. Um, he did the Warcraft movie, but I don't know much about World of Warcraft, so I didn't connect in a big way to that movie, I have to admit. And, um, and yes, like Crichton says, is David Bowie's son. <laughs> a Matt Berry quote, You and he were buddies, weren't you? You know what? I didn't realize this. But um, that's a reference to Matt Berry's role on a um, like six episode show that's hilarious called Garth Marenghi's Dark Place. Apparently, uh, the star and writer of that show just released a book as though it was written by the horror author Garth Marenghi. And my buddy just gave that to me. So I, I'm excited to read that. Let me go back to uh, Rogue Trooper. Yeah, Moon was very good. I totally agree. Um. Ray Bloody Purchase. Yes. Toast of England. Um, I, I'm a big fan of Matt Berry. He, he's hilarious. If you haven't read it, and, and I understand, you know, not everybody reads um, British sci-fi comics and stuff, but um, it has a great pedigree. Written by Jerry Finley Day. Art by Dave Gibbons. Yeah. Watchmen. Uh, Martha Washington goes to war. That Dave Gibbons. Great. Uh, sometimes he's called 19. Sometimes he's just called... You know, Rogue uh, basically doesn't have a name. He's this blue beefcake here. 
and he's a genetically engineered infantryman. This takes place in the future where like two governments are fighting wars on other planets um, that basically have been using chemical warfare and nuclear and stuff. Uh, and it's poisoned, like normal troops can't fight there. So they create like these genetically engineered guys that can, they're, they're sort of just disposable soldiers that can also like survive in harsher environments. Uh, he's the only survivor of a mission at the beginning because there's been a traitor in his government and he's his whole platoon is killed and Rogue is just devoted to hunting down that traitor. It's a revenge army war story. Um, hey, Gene, it's my sister. I always like to say hello. Um, he does sort of have three supporting characters, although they're not like physical people. He's got the AI personalities of three of his comrades that are downloaded into his gun, his helmet and his rucksack. So, um, and they're called like gunner and. Oh, all of a sudden I forget. I get, it's been a minute since I read it and all of a sudden I'm blanking, but anyway, so he has like sort of three friends that he can talk to. Anyway, it's really good. It's, it really is. Um, they're, there have technically been two versions of Rogue Trooper, to be clear, because eventually sort of Rogue Trooper ended and they rebooted the concept in 2000 AD. Uh, and then they sort of wrapped that up and came back to the original. So there are two versions, but like I'm giving you the the, the original origin. It's really good. I, I promise. It's it's like it's it's just action packed. It's really good. You know, I'm not an expert on Nemesis the Warlock, um, but yeah, that's another 2000 AD book. I hope it's good. Um, it's promising. The cast, the director, they said that they're going to animate it digitally using the Unreal Engine, but the Unreal Engine can do a lot. You know, they, they literally use the Unreal Engine for uh, backgrounds these days that are projected on that curved screen called the volume that they make shows like Mandalorian on. So um, they use Unreal for a lot. And I guess they're going to use the Unreal engine to make this movie. Yes, I agree. 2000 AD properties make a lot of sense for animation. It, like I, I, I've never seen an animated Judge Dredd, but it feels like you could probably get a lot closer to the source material doing that as like a, a animation i would love some more dread too i love judge dread the first thing i was introduced for for rogue trooper was um they had reprinted a story in heavy metal magazine when i was growing up so that was where i first uh, got exposed to rogue trooper uh so some of you might listen to synthwave i like synthwave a lot if you've ever watched one of my edited vlogs on this channel, like when I go to Japan, I'll often use some synthwave type music for it. I just like it. But there's a band out there that's pretty cool called The Midnight, and they're making a comic book. It's called The Midnight Shadows. Let's talk about that a little. It's different. Uh, so Dark Horse is the publisher here, and they announced that The Midnight Shadows is going to be a cyberpunk comic set for October 2nd. Uh, it's 136 pages, so it's like a graphic novel, not like a series. Uh, the the actual creators are Zach Kaplan and artist Stephen Thompson, uh, and then the the um, the band is just sort of like worked on the concept and everything for it. Here's the premise. It's big, but it does make a lot, a lot of sense how this is related to the midnight. Let me get back to that. I'll, I'll loop back in a second. So the premise is 20-something young man Jason is on the precipice of parenthood with his childhood sweetheart. Struggling with the loss of his adolescence, Jason is sucked back into The Midnight, a cyberpunk game from his childhood. As the helmeted hero who travels to the post-apocalyptic Neverland in the year 2085, he is the hero who once vanquished the Shadow Monsters, and they believe he has returned to his actual reality to do it again. With two different realities beckoning him home, Jason must reconcile which world he belongs to and how he can embrace adulthood without losing himself. Thematically, that does make sense to me because Synthwave is new, 
but it's nostalgic. It, it's retro. It's based on the sounds of the 80s and, and sort of retro cyberpunk ideas. So the idea of somebody sort of struggling with becoming an adult and being tempted by like, you know, the stuff of his childhood makes a lot of sense. Uh, we'll see. We'll see if it's good. But I that's that's promising as an idea. Thank you for watching that. No, no, I appreciate it. Those are just fun for me to make. The vlogs are quite synthwave now. It's just music that I kind of like and, and I feel like doesn't necessarily distract from, you know, what I'm doing. The vlogs are primarily just sort of like walkthroughs of, of areas so that you can just sort of feel like you're you're there and you're just doing something. We'll see. But um, a promising idea. Will it be good? I don't know. But uh, a promising idea. And I do like the midnight. Look at this cool design for a Scott Pilgrim box set. If you haven't read Scott Pilgrim before, it's the 20th anniversary. I think this is as great a time as any to jump into it. I like Scott Pilgrim quite a bit. Uh, uh, and I love that this sort of makes it look like, you know, a, a PlayStation game console or something like that. Yeah, the old uh, PlayStation Portable logo. <laughs> so, Oni has announced uh, that this August they're going to release two versions of this. There's going to be a black and white version, also a colored comics version. Uh, they're both box sets celebrating Scott Pilgrim's 20th anniversary, technically the anniversary of when the first volume came out. There were uh, six volumes, six volumes. So there's going to be some new art by Brian Lee O'Malley in it, um, new cover art for each of the volumes. They said that there's going to be a slipcase cover that's got new art. Cool. But the big new thing is that the set will come with a new seventh volume called Scott Pilgrim Collected Extras. So it's going to have process art, behind the scenes material, and commentary from Brian Lee O'Malley. Um, they'll have sticker sheets, a sex bob -omb concert poster, hollow foil art print featuring Scott, Ramona Flowers, and Gideon Graves. Cool. Um, that might be enough new stuff to, to, to make me pick it up again. I got to think about it. I, but I do love Scott Pilgrim. It's funny and meaningful. That's my self-birthday gift this year. Very nice. I love Scott Pilgrim. Can't wait for the 20th anniversary box set. I think it's a nice design. How big is that box? Probably not that big, to be honest. Just to be clear, like it looks like it would have, you know, a huge video game system in it. But Scott Pilgrim was all sort of um, manga-sized volumes. I was just trying to grab something representative so it would be kind of like no like six of these to make up the set and then a seventh one so like seven manga volumes in a row plus a few extras that are probably like protected in their own box i never read that yeah brian lee o'malley and matt fraction teamed up to do dr america i should read that i should read that When they did those charity readings for movies during the pandemic, the Scott Pilgrim one was fantastic. Shows how great the script was that it worked without FX. And if you haven't, there is a Scott Pilgrim anime now on Netflix, and it is not an adaptation of the comic. It is a new idea with all of those characters. Uh and I, I don't want to spoil it because it's so different. Uh, it's got the entire voice cast from the live action version of the movie, but it is a new idea. So it is extra Scott Pilgrim content for you. Whoops. I wish I wasn't born in May. Now I want it. Yeah, it could be a present for yourself. <laughs> Thought I'd put that on people's radar. This is obviously going to be a little bit longer. Um, before I read all this, let me give you some background on Jim Valentino um, wanting to give his side of the story of Image Comics to sort of counteract something Eric Larson said. First of all, I'll just like say something without even that. Um, so Image Comics gets formed and there's like six guys and they... Um, they run the place, but there's not necessarily a ton to run, but eventually they did start inviting other creators to make comics through the image label. And uh, at a certain point, they 
realized they needed to install somebody as the publisher and they installed Jim Valentino, which makes sense because um, he had a, a good amount of space publishing in the indie sector before he started drawing and writing at Marvel and then image. But after a few years, uh, the other image founders stepped in and they installed Eric Larson in his place. Uh, after a few years of that, uh, they installed Eric Stevenson, uh, who is still like, you know, the publisher, the guy that like makes a lot of those decisions of who will get like uh, approved to be an image book. But, you know, there was a time when a lot less books got approved to be image books. It was it was a big deal to, to have that image logo. Um, but the creators had different ideas on what kind of books should be image books. Uh, so let's talk about that. So first of all, how did this happen? Well, Eric Larson was on the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. It was like three years ago, to be honest. Uh, so this is replying to something that isn't that recent. And he talked about taking over as the image publisher from Jim Valentino. He said that he had to write the ship. I think that that was one of his quotes. Um, that's why I put it in quotes. Um, so Jim Valentino was recently sick. He, I don't know if it was the flu or a cold or what, but he was in the hospital, okay? And he came out of the hospital and it motivated him. He decided he, it was something he was that, that, that came onto his mind and he wanted to talk about it and give his side of the story. Um, Larson's concern basically was that he felt Jim Valentino had a lot of connections with the indie comics world and he was approving a lot of comics from, you know, lesser known new creators, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but he wasn't bringing in the big names from like, you know, mainstream comics, Marvel and DC, which helps build the image brand. You know, you gotta, you gotta have a mix basically. Oh, it was in, it was pneumonia. Thank you very much for, for the clarification. I thought it might've been, but I couldn't remember. So this is something Jim posted a few days ago to his Facebook page. Let me go through that. Um, something serious. Happy anniversary. Setting the record straight. About a year or so ago, I think it was three years, uh, the cartoonist Cafe boys repeated Eric Larson's writing the ship as his excuse for ousting me as image publisher. I took exception to this with them, and they generously offered me the opportunity to tell my side of the story. I declined. I couldn't do it then, but after my recent stay in the hospital, I find that I'd really like to set the record straight. Creators I brought into Image during my time as publisher include, and these are some great names, Kurt Busick, Mark Wade, George Perez, John Romita Jr., Warren Ellis, Frank Cho, Jimmy Palmiotti, Amanda Connor, Ted McKeever, Kevin Smith, Tom DeFalco, Ross Ritchie, and Joseph Michael Liz Linzer, among others. That is a lot of good names. Um, a few of the books I published during my time as publisher include The Walking Dead, Invincible, Ministry in Space, Powers, The Red Star, Fire Breather, Fire Breather is so underrated, Noble Causes, The Pro, The Gorilla Comics Imprint, Leave It to Chance, Oversized Hardcover Volumes, Liberty Meadows, Blunt Man and Chronic, and friend of the show, Jim Mahfoud's Stupid Comics. Those are some great comics that he approved. No question. Have nothing to object to any of those. I really don't. Those are all smart decisions. Um, I had just brought in old friend Matt Wagner with his seminal comic Mage and was on the verge of bringing over a major talent who would have brought his entire catalog to us. Don't know who that could have been. Haven't been able to figure that out. And I'm not even going to mention the editorial help I gave both The Walking Dead and Invincible. Probably different points of view there. Um, when I, uh, I don't consider any of these to be shitty comics. I don't either. When I inherited Image in 1999, it was a wasteland of semi-professional books, swimsuit issues, and misogynistic titillation comics. The Image Eye had lost its luster. Image books weren't selling. The brand was tainted by amateurs, and established talent was avoiding us like the plague. Uh, and it wasn't profitable. He says that he righted the ship um, and that he did a lot to get into the um, book trade and uh, library market. But... Um, that is, that is to be, in my opinion, still only a part of the story because I remember, you know, I was buying comics at this time. I do remember Image had a lot of books by creators that I didn't recognize. 
um, and that like sort of just came and went, like had a mini series or a one shot and, and didn't really go much further than that. Um, no question that he, he did a ton of great books. No question. Um, you know, I'm sure that like Robert wouldn't be exactly where he was without Jim Valentino. I, I, that, that he definitely affected that. Look at that. Jim is here. Jimmy V rules. He helped me out a lot in the early years of my career. Um, and I'm not tr taking sides in this. I don't know enough to take a side between say like Larson and Valentino. And, and as far as I know, they don't like not get along, but I do think that like, um, I, I think Larson did have a point that like the, the biggest names at the time weren't doing regular ongoing books at image, uh, right then, but who knows? Uh, we weren't privy to everything that was happening behind the scenes at the same time that books were coming out on the shelves that we were seeing. I don't know if they don't get along or anything. I have to imagine there's some mutual respect. They're both still image founding members. You know, they, Jim Lee is left and, and Rob Liefeld was basically well, kicked out, but the rest of them are all still in there. So it's not like they, you know, ganged up on, on one another. I, Jim did a lot uh, for image. He did. I mean, before he was doing his thing, it was like you just sort of had to get invited by the group and approved by the group. And, and there, there was finally some leadership at the helm. Um, but I can understand the concern that it wasn't necessarily all mainstream enough. We'll see. I think a lot of people will still call uh, Image indie. And I, I personally don't really think of Image as indie anymore, per se. I think that like, yeah, I don't think of them really as indie. But... It was just uh, an interesting thing. You're going to have different points of view. I don't have a whole lot to say to say like definitively that Jim Valentino was right and Eric Larson was wrong. I don't have anything like that to say. I just wanted to talk about it. Um, you know, this is telling a big story. This is really, really big. I still think Image Comics overall has the coolest concept um, to allow people to own their own books and get them out there. Sometimes I wonder, you know, was Image Comics, the idea of Image Comics, was that inevitable? Or would it have like never really come together without all those superstars at the height of their popularity? Because of course, like, you know, a lot of people had done uh, creator own stuff, but it was always very indie, you know, it was very small. And um, image image changed the game in a big way. And I wonder, you know, like, would that have happened no matter what? I, I don't know. Comics were at a really big point there, thanks to those creators. And they used their clout to, to launch a new business model. Um, you know, guys like Frank Miller and, and I don't know, uh, Dave Sim and stuff had sort of tried to do, you know, creator-owned bills of rights and stuff before that. You're not Iron Man. You can't fool me. I don't know. I don't know that it was inevitable. I, like if, if image didn't exist then, would it, I, I don't know if the industry would have gotten a set of creators big enough to, to launch something like that. It's really hard to say. Hmm. Well, thanks for the uh, super, super chat there. Hope all is well. Troopers, happy Monday. Well enough. Well enough. It's good to talk to all of you guys. Moving on with the news. I don't have a lot more news. Uh, CGC is back in the news, folks, with another lawsuit. This time, it's them suing somebody else. But again, it's problems for people that have used CGC. They just can't stay out of the news these days. So... This is hard for me to parse because it's just a huge filing and I am not a lawyer, but what I can say are some of the facts. First of all, CGC filed a lawsuit uh, against their former employees, Brandon and Ayana Terrazas, and that's a husband and wife duo. Brandon, uh, this is another fact, was a comics grader. His wife worked in the shipping department. The lawsuit, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to like cover myself because I, I, I'm not sure I'm interpreting this perfectly, but it appears to allege 
I'm pretty confident in that, that they stole comics, that they created fraudulent graded um, banners and stuff for the slabs. Also definitely engaged in selling them, which is something you agree not to do if you're an employee at CGC. You agree not to um, trade in this stuff. Like you're, you're not going to get into the speculation market. Let's see. Uh, thank you, Steve. I think Kirkman revitalized Image Comics as a whole. No question he did. That's why they invited him to be an Image partner. The only Image partner that was not a founder. But I think that they all agree that he did a lot for them. So, yeah, um, this is a long lawsuit. And hold on. There is somebody on Twitter who does have a legal background that did a breakdown of this. So I'm going to just quickly look that up so that I could mention it. I, I, I should have put it here in my show notes, but if you can bear with me a moment, um, I can probably, I can figure it out. Let me just scroll through my timeline a little. Shouldn't have been too far in the past. Okay. The person I'm thinking of is named Paul Lesko. So I'll pull that up on screen. Give me a moment here. Uh, because he does have a long breakdown of this lawsuit that I thought was pretty darn interesting. Let me just uh, put it in a tab and open that tab up. Where is it? Okay. Appreciate your patience while I do this. Hold on. This takes a little bit of maneuvering. Uh, let's see. Present, share screen. And it's this one. Okay, now bear with me as I scroll down to how, how, okay, he posted a bunch today, bear with me. Ah, here it is. So there's his name, Paul underscore Lesko. He says plaintiff's litigator. So that seems to imply that he's, uh, got some legal background and he goes through this. This is a thread where he breaks down and shows the actual court filing and sort of explains what it means. Okay. So anyway, um, I recommend taking a look at that. If you want to see more, um, more information on this bizarre lawsuit, just bizarre, but the, the long and short of it is that like um, uh, in the filing, it, it says Brandon admitted to stealing something like at least 29 comics um, selling them. So, yeah. Yeah. Moving on. I've got a few quick um, Marvel bits. They've teased at 2099. I don't know if reboot is even the night, the right word, but a continuation maybe. The final issue of Miguel O'Hara Spider-Man 2099 came out. That's been a mini series, and the last page had this. It just says coming summer 2024 2099. So I guess we're getting more 2099. Uh, Steve Orlando has been writing the Spidey 2099 book um, since 2022. That was uh, brought back because it was the 30th anniversary of Marvel's 2099 line uh they did a, a cyberpunk story a street level crime oh and i even spelled street completely wrong so that's awesome that's my second mistake ever uh and the last one was horror where every issue spider-man went up against the 2099 version of a monster like werewolf by night zombie man thing kind of fun so what's next i think we all know ravaged 2099 is my best guess. I don't know that for a fact, but how could Stanley and Paul Ryan's Ravage 2099 not be the next big thing? This was a man who used to be a corporate CEO and he gets fired and he uses things like a garbage truck um, and, and clothes that he found in the dumpster to become a superhero called Ravage because his last name is literally Ravage. It was the last... Marvel Comics, Stan Lee wrote for them. Everything leads to Ravage 2099. Ravage was so whack. Ravage 29, 2099 drove a garbage truck. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, Marvel has teased this. This is, this is their update of Carnage. 
uh, I wouldn't consider that an improvement. It's it's fine, I guess. It might make sense for the storyline. So this is a new crossover event they'll have called Symbiosis Necrosis. And it's going to have Venom and Anti-Venom battling an upgraded version of Carnage. Uh, the story is going to start in Venom issue 31 by Torin Gronbeck and Ken Lashley. They're both talented. Uh, basically, right now, if you're not following along, Carnage has created a cult to worship him. He's working on becoming a god. Best guess is he is successful. And the story will apparently feature all three people that have been Venom. Uh, Eddie Brock, his son Dylan, and Flash Thompson, who, I, as long as I... I'm up to date is currently agent anti-venom. Yes, exactly right. The carnage design isn't busy enough. Uh, I don't know. I don't know, folks. Why have one set of horns when you can have eight legs, you know, like a spider and, and this symbol? Uh, yeah, created a cult, kind of like he did in the Spider-Man 2 video game. But because of the timing on everything, I, I have to imagine that that's technically a, a coincidence. I, I don't know. Oh, yeah, that's right. Black Widow uh, has been Venom recently. I don't know what's happening with her. I didn't see her mentioned. Needs a tail? Why, why one tail when you can have one, two, three, four tail-like appendages? He's overpowered now? Hmm. Anyway, <laughs> uh, well, Venom's gotten more powerful, so I guess Carnage needs to be more powerful. Ah, the constant escalation of superhero books. Um, meanwhile, uh, Marvel has also teased what's happening next with Miss Marvel. Ms. Marvel? Is, she, is Kamala call, called Miss Marvel or Ms. Marvel? I don't know. Uh, Going to be teaming up with characters like Wolverine and Deadpool and Psylocke. Popular characters. Uh, so yeah, Marvel released this preview. Um, it's called Miss Marvel Mutant Menace, another mini series. Again, writer Amon Valani, uh, who plays the character in live action. Also, uh, Sabir Perzada, who has been a writer on the Miss Marvel show um, and writes the comic with her. And then artist Scott Godlewski. So four issue miniseries, Kamala's returning to Jersey City, and now she has to deal with anti-mutant hate. People know that she's a mutant. Um, yeah, shows some of the characters that she'll team up with. Could be fun. Could be fun. Hit shops March 6th. Pay me, Marvel. Uh, this is something we've all been curious about. When is that X-Men 97 cartoon supposed to come out already? They've been talking about that for what feels like a couple years. Well, this is a rumor, but Alex Perez at the Cosmic Circus, they, they do, you know, Hollywood type scoops. He says that he has insider info that Marvel will air the 10 episode cartoon on Disney Plus in March, maybe late March. We'll see. That's not too far away. Uh, the cartoon is confirmed to be set several months after the series finale of the X-Men animated series called Graduation Day and that Mr. Sinister will be the main enemy uh, for X-Men 97. Also, Magneto will be joining the team. Wow. On a related note, looks like the same team, right? Well, it was. Uh, over in Japan, they actually did a manga adaptation of the cartoon, and Viz is going to bring that to English for the first time. You're right. Uh, they, they better just use the original theme song. So, uh, Viz announced that there's going to be English editions this year of X-Men and also uh, Spider-Man Octogirl, if you remember that. I'll recap. So, X-Men is an adaptation of the animated series, story and art by Hiroshi Higuchi. Uh, that's going to come out in November, so still a ways off. Octogirl, that's the one where Dr. Octopus wakes up and finds himself in a middle school girl, a, a nerd that gets teased, but with his intellect and memories. That story is by Hideyuki Furuhashi and art by Betancourt. That's cool. Betancourt does the uh, My Hero Academia, uh, what is it, Extra Missions or 
something like that. Does does Smash? I don't know. Does the spinoff uh, manga. That comes out October. That one I'm kind of curious about. I might check out Octogirl. I might. Phrasing? What did I do wrong this time? Whoops. Oops. Octo Isekai. That is a very good way to refer to it. Oh, you forgot about it? Well, I'm bringing it back. I'm bringing it back. Two more pieces of news. As long as I'm talking about Viz, I thought I'd uh, mention they noted some other titles that they're going to bring to us in 2024. Uh, a couple of them I'm interested in for sure. So we're talking about a sequel to Battle Royale called Battle Royale Enforcers. Uh, I love that original manga. Uh, I love the movie. I love the book. Uh, I, I like it all. So I'm curious about that. Uh, um, My Neighbor Totoro movie frame edition is in like, you know, they take the cells from the movie to, to make a manga out of it. Oh, okay. Betancourt does Vigilantes. Thank you. Uh, there's a Haikyuu, uh, which is the volleyball manga. They're going to put like three volumes into one. So nice, big, thick editions. A Spy Family anime guide, a, the Deadpool Samurai manga. They're going to make a coloring book out of that. There's a new Junji Ito uh, horror anthology called a Alley. Always up for, for some Junji Ito horror. Uh, the Star Wars Visions manga is getting a release in English. And Naruto Sasuke's story. I've never read Naruto, but you know I know that people like it. So I thought I'd mention. So uh, a few big few big uh, books, I think, for uh, Viz uh, coming out in the coming year. Viz tends to get all the big licenses, don't they? Final piece of news. Ninja Turtles posted some really amazing sales. Don't have the exact numbers because, as I often complain, um, that stuff is not very transparent anymore. But we did get a list of the best-selling full like comics or manga for the year. So Circana book scan released the top 10 graphic novel sales for all of last year. Demon Slayer volume one was the, the number one bestseller, but number two was the last Ronin hardcover. That's impressive because take a look at what comes after that. Uh, Chainsaw man, spy family, Jujutsu Kaisen, Berserk, another Jujutsu Kaisen, another Chainsaw Man, another Spy Family, My Hero Academia. It beat like eight other mangas. Like it outsold it. That's pretty good for an American comic is all I'm saying. Uh, Last Ronin was a huge hit for IDW. Huge, huge hit. So uh, good for them. The other thing I'd love to have had for news would be to try to explain whatever's going on with the uh, Cadence comic art. Uh, but, you know, Declan didn't want to talk about that, and I don't blame him. Uh, but I I don't understand. Let me let me break it down. There are these days a lot of um, art dealers that, that represent uh, comic book artists and sell their original art. Uh, there's tons of them. If you go to any... Um, comic convention now they tend to get a block of tables with their artists and one of the, the them has been uh cadence comics art but for some reason over the last couple of days like about 30 or 40 maybe more artists have all just quietly left so i don't understand what's going on there i wish i could explain that as news i just don't know i just don't know thank you michael still waiting on a few reprints of the viz Big Vagabond books to complete my collection. Well, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've never read Vagabond, uh, but I do love uh, Takehiko Inoue. So I would love to read those. Last Ronin was really fun. It was, it, it, it's good. Um, the only American comic book in the top 10. Only. Anyway, uh, oh no, is that true? Jose Delbo passed away. Jose Delbo was never like a big name, but definitely drew a lot of the comics that I read as a kid. He was, he was sort of like, you know, a, a workhorse, uh, uh, you know, just like a go-to guy that could get it done. 
he drew a bunch of the American Transformer comics that Marvel did back in the day. Um, I think he may have done that book called something like Beast Force. It was like a four issue miniseries at Marvel of like animals getting cybernetic implants. It was like grizzly bear and a dolphin and stuff like that. Um, he, you know, he was maybe not always exciting, but certainly easy to read. Yeah. My first comics were his Transformer comics. Yeah. Very clean style. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. He did draw Wonder Woman. That's right. That's good. Yeah. He was good. Oh, that well, that's too bad. 90 though. 90 is pretty good. I don't know how many of us want to like live a whole lot longer than 90 at that point. Brute force. That was it. I'm pretty sure Jose Delbo drew brute force, which is a pretty funny, unintentionally funny comic. I mean, some of it's intentional, but I don't think, I think that they thought they were creating a new property that was going to be popular. It's pretty weird. Let's, um, Let's review a few comics that came out this week, because actually it was a big week for, for comics, for new comics, and some of them are really cool. I've got some thoughts. I've got some opinions. Extra camera. Let's, let's do it like this. I'm going to have to move things a little. Or can I move this over? Uh, I've got to be careful. There's a cord. Okay. There we go. That's a pretty good. That's a pretty good framing job. I guess I don't have a whole lot to say about Duke, which just happens to be on the cover, other than that it, this is a very fun take on GI Joe, uh, and it introduces some characters I wouldn't have guessed at. Like it, it introduces Clutch, one of the original Joes, and it turns out. He's he just grew up as childhood friends with with Duke. And so Duke is on the run in this comic. Instead of going to his active duty army buddies or family, he goes to his childhood friend Clutch. Clutch was always like the driver of the vamp in the comics. But in the background here, we see that he has a degree from MIT um, and he works at like a, uh, you know, a used car yard. But he's pretty happy with his life. Uh, he's not like he's not in love with with Duke bringing him into uh, everything that's going on. Who's hunting Duke down? That's fun. Look at like how Tom Riley draws this. That's rock and roll. Future the GI Joe does not currently exist within these comics, but future GI Joe members Rock and Roll and Stalker have been assigned to take to bring in Duke, and I think that just looks great. That is a really nice take on um. On, on Duke. I think that like one of the things that, that this is good at is um, Tom Riley is good at um, technology and stuff. So like vehicles look, you know, like sharp, angular, believable guns are, are detailed. And, uh, you know, those are important things in a book like this. I mean, this is clutch driving away with, with Duke and that isn't the vamp, but it looks a lot like the vamp. So uh, really good art uh, in this, and Stalker is a fantastic character. I was really excited to see him in this. Also, Stalker says that he's uh, going to use a move that an old friend taught him, which is this like uh, spinning back kick. I think that that certainly implies that even in this new continuity, Stalker uh, served with Snake Eyes in the um, in the original comics continuity by Larry Hama. Stalker, Storm Shadow, and Snake Eyes all served in Vietnam on um, long-range recon patrol uh, and are very good friends. We'll see. But really good art, really fun story where the main character is on the run. That makes him an underdog. Let's, let's talk about Moon Man. Obviously, this is going to come with a certain amount of Maybe I'll call it prestige. Certainly, I, I'll call it like press, where um, it, it, it's uh, co-written by Kid Cudi, Scott Muscutty, uh, also better known as, as rapper and actor Kid Cudi. This is a sci-fi story co-written with Kyle Higgins, who is the um, writer of things like uh, Radiant Black. 
Art by somebody new to me, Marco Locati. This is sort of like um, serious sci-fi, not like fantastical. It, it's set in like sort of the near future. And Ramon is this guy who I guess piloted a shuttlecraft from the moon, but he can't remember everything that happened. Nobody on the, on, on it can. And so doctors are doing a test, they're doing tests. Something happened to him. We don't know what yet. He also has like a strained relationship with, um, his son. So this is a very like grounded, realistic story. This is a lot of pages, by the way, look at how many pages it is, um, for the first issue. So it's a good value at $3.99 for what comics are these days, okay? It's a good value for what comics are. Um, as many pages as it is, this is a slow burn. I would call this promising without being able to call it excellent yet because we need to hear more about the overall premise in his relationships. Oh, thank you for the correction. Oh, Micah isn't his son. It's his younger brother. Whoops. Didn't. Didn't realize that. Ooh, that's embarrassing for me. Yeah, there's. I haven't heard that yet, actually, but I heard that it was out. I need to listen to it because I I've liked a lot of um, Kid Cudi's music. Uh, he made Black Ops featuring Denzel Curry, uh, and and so there's there's music attached to this. That's kind of unique. You can't think of too many comics that have uh, a single attached to them. I like this. It's promising in terms of its design and stuff like that. Um, like that's a pretty two page spread. There's no question. It, it asks some interesting questions. Uh, I don't fully know what his sort of abilities are or where this is going. So I'm sort of reserving full judgment until I can read at least two issues of it. Okay. That that's um, I hate to like not have a strong recommendation uh, one way or the other. I just feel like I need a little bit more to this, uh, but I don't think it's badly paced or anything, if that makes sense. That's true. The colors are good. Let's open that up and, and give credit to the uh, colorist because you're right. Like, look at like, even like the, the splash page, that's pretty vibrant. Um, oranges and purples are, are really great. Opposite one another uh, colors, Igor Monty. I'm not familiar, but it looks good. Let's see. Moon Man presented an interesting setting, so I'm looking forward to see where it goes. Okay, good. I like it. Uh, the colors for Moon Man look really good. The two-page spreads are especially beautiful. Got it. Always a pleasant surprise when celebrities make good comics. Uh, yeah, uh, it does seem promising. Uh, I want it to be good because I like Kyle and I like Kid Cudi, but I'm sort of reserving judgment until I get further. I will say though, like that's a pretty good logo too, right? The the moon, like an actual crescent moon for for the second O, but it reads pretty reads pretty well. That's a good logo. Sirens of the City wrapped up, folks. Uh, issue six, published through Boom Studios. Joanne Stara wrote this. Carrie Randolph drew it. I think it's some of Carrie's best art. It's about supernatural creatures living amongst people in 1980s New York City. It deals with, you know, pregnancy scares and all sorts of weird subcultures from punks to um, all sorts of cool stuff. Oh, let's uh, let's definitely plug that. Yes, Jim did a variant cover for Moon Man issue three. Uh, he shared that. It looks amazing. Uh, that's out in late March. So yeah, in February, we'll get Moon Man 2. And in March, we'll get number three. And maybe you can get Jim's variant cover, which would always be fun. Good for you, Jim. That's really cool. You're, you're a talented guy, Jim. Jim and I recorded our first episode of our movie review show. Editor Jamie has the reins now. No rush. This isn't something we're, we're planning on cranking out, but um, like again and again and again, but, but, but we have an idea for a show and we had a lot of fun making it. So I'm excited to share that with you. I just wanted to say that Sirens of the City, if you haven't picked it up, um, it's a really good story, folks. And I think this is some of Carrie's best artwork. 
I've been a fan of Carrie for, for so long. Jesus, I think I've known him for over 20 years now. Um, some like really, I've, I've said this before in a review, look at how each of these characters definitely looks different. Like, yes, it's the same style, but you can tell that that's one, two, three, four different people there, right? Like men don't look the same. Women don't look the same. Artists always have a challenge with same faciness when they're doing comics because you're doing it on a, on a deadline. Um, this is dynamic. It's exciting. Great character design. Some of Carrie's best work. Um, did I know that Carrie did character design for Wolverine and the X-Men? I definitely did. He also did um, a lot of work on the Ninja Turtles show, uh, the second animated show, the one that was, so yeah. Tra yes, trash movie bonanza. It's coming. It's coming, folks. Start getting excited. Trust me, it's gonna it's gonna be bonkers. It's gonna be bonkers. So, um, damn them all. Uh, wrapped up. You know what? It's hard. I, I don't think I want to um, show you much of this because issue 12 of a 12 issue story, it would sort of be spoiling stuff at this point. But if you've enjoyed books like Constantine or you just enjoy, you know, sort of um, anti-hero main characters that like are clever enough to get one over on their opponents, uh, Damn Them All is good. Damn Them All is a supernatural book uh, where the main character, uh, Ellie is, oh boy, she's, she's clever. She is really, really clever. She outthinks her enemies. And the final issue here has a fantastic twist, fantastic twist. Uh, hold on. Somebody says what channel? Oh, uh, the movie, I, we're going to start by putting the, the reviews on this channel when they come out, because this already exists. So, and, and, and that's better than just starting a brand new channel, I think. And we'll see if we can, um, really uh, get it out there, but yeah, I really recommend this Simon Spurrier, Charlie Adler. Um, if you enjoyed Charlie's work on walking dead, this is, this is a level up folks. This is real. I think he was really passionate about this. It's really cool. Really cool. Uh, what else did I get this week? Boy, there's a bunch of books. I'll just, uh, Batman Offworld is fun. It's definitely not necessarily like the deepest book you'll get, but Jason Aaron always delivers, you know, some good character work. Doug Monkey is the main reason I'm getting this. Always been a fan of Doug's work. He's a really interesting artist. Uh, he draws, you know, big, beefy, strong superheroes that still look like you know, real people. He comes up with interesting alien designs, uh, solid storytelling. Uh, you know, some of his early work was on stuff like The Mask at uh, Dark Horse uh, back in the early 90s. And he's just continued to evolve and grow as an artist. But this, what this does give you, Batman Offworld, is about the most badass Batman can be. You know, th this is a Batman that's going up against aliens that are much stronger than him, but he he does his detective work to understand their weak points, and he trains, and he kicks a lot of ass in it. He kicks a lot of ass. And in this, you'd almost think that the story is over, and then Batman wants to do even more. He wants to go against, like, you know, sort of a boss of a boss of a boss. It's crazy crazy it's fun last week i think it was maybe it was the week before we talked about wolverine issue 42 saber tooth war saber tooth has an army of alternate reality saber tooths and he's trying to punish wolverine for uh because he loves to punish him on his birthday and this year is this is just one of the most violent Wolverine comics I've ever seen. It it, it doesn't like push the bo the boundary that much because it is still a Marvel comic, but they chain Wolverine up in adamantium um, coils that they took from a uh, 
an Omega Red that they killed in another reality. And Wolverine basically shreds his own tendons and stuff to get out of that. So he's walking around without feet or hands for a bunch of this issue. Uh, and his his clone daughter, Laura, is missing at the end. Did Sabretooth kill her? It's possible. Sabretooth is like killed a bunch of Wolverine's friends in this. And, and they're past the mutant resurrection protocol. So, so these characters are, at least for now, they're definitely dead. The only thing I can say is Wolverine definitely gets his revenge by killing a lot of those Sabretooth people from other dimensions. We're, we're winnowing it down to Sabretooth and Wolverine. We're winnowing it down fast, fast. It is kind of fun. It is kind of fun. It's all, it's, it's, it hasn't quite been two hours. So uh, we've got a little time. Um, I strongly recommend Avengers Twilight. I, I thought the premise setting it in the near future, well, not even that much near, but in the future where Captain America is sort of an old man and the world has passed him by. This is a, a an America that has decided not to elect Steve and is honestly showing themselves to be quite fascist. Uh, I'm trying to see if I can find a page where they're sort of like just having, um, what do you call it? Like uh, their police more or less beat up on, um, you know, people that are out past their curfew, very minor stuff. Um, I can't find a great page that, that doesn't like show that. Oh, here, the, here, the, the, the first page shows some people like just sort of beating up on a homeless man. And, and people aren't allowed to use their phones and stuff to um, record in public anymore. But in this, we finally learn who the villains are. And it has been a very long-term plan to slowly change society by the Red Skull and Ultron working together. It makes sense. It does make sense. And it shows that the world still needs somebody like Captain America and how he can influence people to possibly be better. But it is not an easy road. He ruins his marriage. He um, he he just has very poor relationships at this point with anybody. So he's really sacrificing a lot to try to change public opinion in this world. Uh, yeah. At first I was like, who is this character? Like, am I supposed to remember this character? But no, it's um, Red Skull has formed a long-term disguise. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you like it? I like it too. Yeah, it is. It is a lot like Dark Knight Returns or Kingdom Come, which I haven't. I've seen something close to that here and there, but this is really good, folks. This is good. It is sort of an alternate reality story, but boy, and Daniel Acuna's art is, is great too. It's great too. Um, I don't think you need to know a whole lot about Marvel Comics to read this book and, and get something out of it. You know, anything that you've picked up from pop culture on characters like Captain America and Iron Man and that is more than enough. It isn't like delving into dense continuity here. None of, none of that's that important. So um, this is towards the top of my pile. Uh, I, I really enjoyed that quite a bit. Uh, the last one I'll talk about briefly is just that Incredible Hulk continues to be fun. We've got Philip Kennedy Johnson writing and Nick Klein on art. Uh, pretty sh pretty soon we're getting a fill-in artist. Um, Danny Earls is stepping in for, for a few issues. But uh, this features a new Ghost Rider and Hulk teaming up against monsters. This is a, a World War II themed Ghost Rider, e even though it's in the modern day. And look, he's just like going around with like, you know, um, a rocket launcher or grenade launcher against demons. It's it's so fun. Meanwhile, like, you know, in Bruce's mind, he's dealing with being trapped in the Hulk. So we're dealing with some good bo body horror stuff. Uh, it looks good. It's fun. It's fun. Hulk versus monsters is the overall theme of this run. This is issue eight, and each issue features the Hulk going up against a weird monster. Perfect. The Hulk is a monster, but mostly, obviously, has been either a superhero or sci-fi and stuff. Not a lot necessarily playing up the horror element. This... The Immortal Hulk did play up the horror element, but not with like necessarily a lot of extra monsters per se. Um, 
that was definitely more like, oh, corrupt government and stuff um, uh, and, and supernatural horror. But this is against monsters and it's great. It's really, really good. Oh, I love this idea. You want to see uh, <laughs> Ghost Rider on a, I think it's called Penny Farthing, isn't it? Like that's the bicycle with the uh, humongous front wheel and the tiny back wheel. Uh, where you have to like hop up and balance and you're like, you're up like a story in the air. Like what an unsafe design. What were they thinking? What were they thinking? Uh, but anyway, it really is a, a fun book right now. So um, Marvel has a few fun books. I think that uh, um, right now the best stuff that Marvel's doing is Incredible Hulk and Avengers Twilight. Uh, the stuff I like most from DC is probably the stuff like uh, World's Finest and um is there anything else i don't know it's it's all about art right now no what's this did i hear about the comics are dying the comic project i definitely did not hear about whatever that is i'm sorry um it's interesting your current job now makes you a gi joe just like this new storyline gi joe international hero i'm canadian could you relate to the used car story arc <laughs> um Maybe a little bit. Maybe a little bit. Yeah, world's fun. Oh, thank you. You're right, Crichton. I was trying to think. I, I I was trying to think of an artist. I was like, Dan, Daniel, Daniel. And I kept thinking like Daniel Warren Johnson. I was like, no, he's doing Transformers. I was thinking of Daniel Sampier, who's doing a great job on Wonder Woman. Yes, I really like Wonder Woman a lot. Uh, I like Beast World, but just the regular series and Titans, not the tie-ins. Yeah, that looked like too much for me to try. Um, I haven't been to TCAF in Toronto. I haven't been to Toronto in... Boy. Oh, 20 years? It's a nice city, though. It's a really nice city. Thank you for the Super Chat, John. Let's see. Don't have tabs on this week's books, but Monday means it's time to get in. Hashtag Peace Pop Pete what everybody wants thank you for the kind words uh it's a book that got announced today with one writer and 100 artists about the comics industry mark wade is involved in some way oh hmm. yeah still haven't come across that that's new i haven't read rat queens i heard about it but i haven't read it is it good Ghost Rider invades Victorian Northampton on his flaming penny farthing, and only Alan Moore's great-grandfather, Alain McMoore, can stop him. I I'd read it. I'd read it. Um, if you wanted to show your sequential work, I don't know, just tag me in social media, maybe, something like that, and I can try to take a look. Um as long as I've got time. I know that sounds ridiculous. Like, who doesn't have time to click on a link? But sometimes that's me, to be honest. Uh, this is like me putting on a show for two hours, but this is sort of my downtime. I'll be honest, even though it requires a little bit of preparation to have the news and some thoughts on the comics, sometimes an interview, this is my downtime. As soon as I'm done with this, I'm going back to editing my current script for the next comic tropes. I need to pick a movie that, uh, Jim and I are going to review next and um, I've got a lot to do on the next comic tropes. I uh, got work tomorrow. Yeah. And when do you eat? You know what? That's sort of become a problem, to be honest. I'm um I'm not eating regularly, which means then I get hungry and I sort of eat more than I should at some of the meals. Um, and I think it's really led to me putting on some weight in a way that I don't. I don't like. So it's definitely something that I'm super concerned with these days. I'm, um, yeah, we'll see. Something to think about. Star Crash. Yeah, that's that, that is one. Oh, that's kind of you to say. I, I enjoy putting on a show. I really do. Um, let's see. Will there ever be a comic tropes about Otto Binder and his fascinations with USO, UFOs and the occult? That's an interesting angle. That's a really good idea. That's a really good idea. Um, I didn't have a plan to do that specifically, although Otto Binder I've touched on with um, an episode about Shazam uh, that I really enjoyed making. And I always wondered if I would get around to sort of talking about Otto Binder's work on like, say, Superman and that. So, but um, hmm, yeah. 
Yeah. Yep. Still got my uh, PO box. Absolutely. Maybe I should mention that um, in the descriptions a little bit more often, but I do still have my PO box and I do have um, about six or seven comics that people have sent. So at some point when I can carve out a little time, I'm going to do a live stream and open them up and just give my thoughts. That would be nice. Oh, wow. Well, that's really nice to hear, uh, Beowulf. I hope you're feeling pretty healthy now. That would be nice. That would be nice. Yeah, totally understand. It's it's been it's it's a late night, so uh, thanks for dropping by. Appreciate that. Maybe do a mukbang episode once in a while, <laughs> right? Anything for content. T turn my whole life into content. Good idea. You know what? Um, my store didn't have issue two of Masterpiece, so I do still need to pick up issue two of Masterpiece. I like the premise of issue one. I would like to read that. I would like to read that. Um too early for me to give big thoughts on the ultimate universe. Uh, I would say, you know, the stuff that set it up by Jonathan Hickman was interesting, but very sci-fi. Um, I'd like to just sort of see it settle into some more character drama. I think that that's where a lot of the Marvel characters excel is by having interpersonal relationships. Uh, ask the wife to build a nice sandwich. She seems like a great partner. Chrissy is the best. No question about that. She And she does cook for me a fair amount, which is really generous of her. I don't expect her to, but she does a lot. And when she does, she'll often make me healthy things like a salad or something, which I'm happy to eat. I'm, I'm grateful. Uh, yeah, those are all uh, very realistic uh, uh, wants. Uh, I have wanted to do... Asterix, Don Rosa, Mazinger Z, those are all very realistic. I'd likely cover Karl Barks first and then Don Rosa, but Asterix has definitely been something um, on my to-do list. I've got so many to-do list uh, ideas. Uh, and when it comes to Mazinger Z, yeah, um, yeah, that's definitely a uh, realistic uh, request. That's definitely realistic. The Goon, great comic. Eric Powell's a really talented. I didn't know Ultimate Black Panther came out already. That means it, it might have sold, sold out at my store. I had a second store that I could go to um, that was kind of close to me. Um, if my first comic shop didn't necessarily have everything in stock that I wanted to read, because I do want to read it in a timely manner, like for this show. Uh, but... Um, they went, uh, they went out of business. They were at like, um, the local mall and I guess the mall raised its rent. So like, uh, the last day of January was its last day. So I don't have my, my, the comic shop that I go to is like about 30 minutes away. It's frustrating. It's a bit of a drive. I don't mind that much, but it's a bit of a drive. I don't have much that's close. Your town has an abundance of comic shops. That sounds so nice. Do you know the French duo team, Kettershot? I don't. I don't. Huh. Anyway, I, I feel like I'm just rambling, but I'm always happy to answer uh, questions that you guys have. Uh, that's very kind. Things from another world is like five minutes away from me. Oh, cool! That's very cool. Yeah, I've been I've been to one of the Things from Another World stores in um, Portland. Portland has so many great stores. So many great stores. At least you have a comic book store. I mean, sort of. Yeah, yeah, I, I do. I, I'm grateful for that. Uh, I'm grateful for that. Yeah. There's um. There's a second comic book. There's a comic book store, like, you know, in a town, maybe more like 10 minutes from me or something. But um, it's awful. It's, it's, it, I'm not even going to name it. it. It's really bad. It's really bad. And I'll be honest, it kind of depresses me to um, have a bad comic store. Uh, did you know David Fincher almost directed a Spider-Man movie? I don't know if I remember that or not. I know that like David Fincher has almost done a bunch of stuff. I like David Fincher. He's very talented. Um, boy, I... It's hard to imagine him doing something like um, Spider-Man because I think that the best Spider-Man still has a little bit of lightheartedness. Any health updates? Um, 
you know, like uh, I remember last year, I definitely was really scared because of something that was going on and it matched up with symptoms of my father's cancer. So I was really scared for a while, but we did rule that out. Fortunately, I, I don't seem to have any indications of having cancer. So that's nice. I would just say that like, um, unfortunately, as I get older, uh, it becomes more important to eat well and exercise well, because um, I am dealing with like a bunch of things. Like I, I've got really severe back pain these days. I've got like it, but, but here's the weird thing. I wake up in the morning. I feel fine. I feel great. If I have to sit for a long time at my day job, at the end of the day, I start feeling pain, right? I come home, I sit on the couch and maybe watch TV for like 10 minutes or eat or something like that. And I can barely stand up. Or if I lay down in bed to like read at that point, I can barely get up. So I need to see a doctor. I don't know what that is. Wow. Larry Hama and James O'Barr. That, that would be very cool. I think that they've met each other too. Um, and, and that they get along. Oh yeah. My shoulder, my shoulder, I had frozen shoulder. That, that was almost two years that it was frozen. Um, I still feel a little pain when I'm, um, stretching it in certain, uh, angles, but I've got like almost full range of motion back. Thank God. It just slowly came back over time. And, um, yeah, trust me, that is amazing. Oh my God. Was it so bad? Um, a pinched nerve. I think it's more serious than that, to be honest, Beowulf, because it, it, it's bad. The, 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 the not being able to stand up thing. It's really bad. It scares me a little like I, how I just can barely do it. Let's see. I sat backwards at a table chair to help my back pain backwards at a table chair. I get what you're saying there. Yeah. Uh, I had the same thing, ended up getting surgery Maybe that's why I'm sort of slow to see a doctor because I'm, you know, we, we all want to put that stuff off. The Riker maneuver. Well, that was because, of course, uh, uh, the actor has b severe back pain. Uh, wh wh who plays um, Riker again? Um, Jonathan Frakes. Jonathan Frakes. He's got real bad um, back pain. So if you ever saw him like standing on Star Trek The Next Generation, he would often actually have his hand on a chair to sort of subtly brace himself. And and the, he, he didn't like to sit down on a chair normal. But anyway. Uh, I don't have a blood pressure machine, but I, I measure it every once in a while. And actually, I've got that. That's totally good. My, my blood pressure is really good. Yeah. David Fincher almost directed a lot of comic book movies. Torso by Bendis. Frank Miller's Hard Boiled with Nicolas Cage as the star. I could see either of those. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Well, I guess that should probably do it. We've had a two-hour show. Um, again, thank you to Declan Shalvey. Uh, that was a huge treat. Um, uh, sorry, I was... Uh, yes, we did talk quite a bit about the uh, Rogue Trooper movie news earlier. So that, that I'm looking forward to that. That should... I, I'm hopeful. Uh, I'm I like that character a lot. And I like a lot of the talent involved. So fingers crossed it could come out well. Um, but yeah, Declan, thank you so much. If you guys haven't... Um, Old Dog is a really good book uh, that he uh, wrote and illustrated. Uh, he wrote Time Before Time. Those are both creator-owned books. Uh, and, um, Thundercats is something where I've never necessarily been, uh, a massive Thundercats head or anything, but I liked it growing up. I definitely liked the cartoon. I think it was, um, a, a notch above most animated shows in terms of the animation quality was what it had going for it. And it was kind of weird. Uh, so I, I am looking forward to trying out the comic this week. I am looking forward to it. Uh, read Bog Bodies too. Okay. Bog Bodies. I can, I think I can remember that. Yeah, we have one more interview coming up next week. Um, then I might take, uh, you know, some time off from the uh, interviews and maybe just do something at the end of the show, like drawing again. That That's also fun to do. Uh, but we do have another interview with um, a longtime person in the industry, somebody that's got a lot of history in the industry. Uh, so that could be very, very interesting. Um, looking forward to it. Uh, let's see. So I hope you guys will consider stopping by. Uh, and, uh, thank you very much, Mandela Butterfly. I appreciate the support. 
Um, quiz. I don't know. Does anybody really want me to do those? It seemed like most people didn't really love that, that I did quiz. Is it an interview with Spider-Man? It's with somebody that's worked on Spider-Man. It's uh, definitely with somebody that worked on Spider-Man. Uh, that's not what we're going to necessarily focus on, but yeah. Um, uh, there's always a delay. So I was just seeing if there's any sort of response to anything I, I said. Uh, everybody gets one interview with Spider-Man. Oh, but thinking of Spider-Man. So this is silly, but over on the Comic Tropes channel, I did upload a short that I just had like a silly idea for. And it's just me reacting to people in Spider-Man suits trying to do flips. So maybe take a look at that if you want to see something kind of weird. Uh, I think that that should be fun. Quizzes are fun. I love the quiz, not going to lie. Uh, I, it's tempting, but you know what? I do have a lot to do on Comic Tropes and I've got work tomorrow. So I'm... I, tonight, at least, I won't. If um, another show in the near future seems to sort of wrap up a little bit earlier than than normal, I will. I'll do another one. But um, I, I got I got to get going so that uh, you guys can hopefully get a comic tropes episode this weekend. Uh, I had a great time talking to everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Your support means everything. Yeah, please consider hitting like and subscribe, uh, sharing it with. Uh, other people that maybe haven't checked it out yet. That that helps me quite a bit, but I had a great time. Keep reading comics. Double salute. You earned it. You know you did. Take care.